Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the RX Question Lab. I'm your host tonight, Jeff Downing, and uh, I want to welcome each and every one of you to tonight's session where we are going to tackle questions connected to Step 2 CK. Now, um, as many of you know, we, we uh, often uh, focus on topics within Step 1, um, but this is, uh, this is going to be focused on Step 2. However, if you are preparing for, you know, for step one, um, there's still a lot you can learn here, uh, you know, uh, focusing on some of these clinical questions. So we, uh, we certainly encourage you to, uh, to, to stick with us, even if uh, these uh, questions get a little bit tricky. Um, in order to have a, a good event, I'm going to have to have a great co-host, and luckily I do. Uh, Dr. Paris Vicaria is here. Paris, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Jeff. Um, hey guys, my name is Paris. I am a current dermatology resident here in Dallas, Texas. I uh, originally graduated from pharmacy school and went back to complete medical school. I'm also an RX coach for USMLE RX, so I work one-on-one -on -one, uh, with students such as yourselves to help uh, prepare you guys for the USMLE Step 1 and Step 2 CK, and I'm happy to help lead tonight's session. Keep me honest, everybody. Um, so with that, again, we're going to go in and we're going to uh, uh, open up our first question of the night. Now, again, uh, like I said, we, um, uh, we have a, uh, a, a particular method that we use uh, with RX Coach. Uh, and part of that is, is that, you know, the first thing we, you know, we recommend you do is that you cover up the answer choices. Now, the reason that we uh, advise this is that... We don't want you to see uh, a term or a phrase or a drug or a condition that um, that you don't know <laughs> show up in the answer choice and then throw you off of your game. Okay, we feel like uh, the 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 you know if you uh, take this step by step, uh, that that you'll have uh, a much better uh, uh, success rate and. More importantly, you'll have a way of of, of going through these questions in a, uh, in a in a in a very structured way uh, each time. So we cover up the answer choices, and then we uh, uh, read the the the, the lead-in, which is the actual question part um, of the item. So in this case, the uh, the lead-in is which of the following is associated with this patient's disease process? Okay. So we read that first, and then uh, we read the vignette. You know, again, but we we look at that question and we think about what kind of information we might want to be, uh, uh, you know, keeping an eye out for as we read the story. So we're gonna uh, now read the vignette. A three-year-old boy is brought to the pediatrician because his mother noticed a reddish purple rash on his buttocks and thighs. Similar findings are shown in the photograph. She notes that he has not seemed well since he had a mild cold two weeks earlier. He has been complaining of stomach ache, along with aches and pains in his legs. His temperature is 37, pulse is 115, and blood pressure is 106 over 82. Physical examination is notable for palpable purpura uh, on his buttocks and bilateral lower extremities with abdominal pain on palpation. Urinalysis shows 10 to 20 RBCs and 2 plus proteinuria. So again, the question, which of the following is associated with this patient's disease process? And one thing I'll ask you to do is think about how many steps you think it would take uh, to reach the answer. And with that, I will pass it over to Paris. Paris? Thank you, Jeff. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead. And as you can see, you know, we're starting off with a pretty clinical question here, right? We're given a picture of a rash. We're told about lab findings, uh, vital signs. Um, so these are the types of questions where, you know, it's going to be important to pick up on all those clues. And you can see there that we kind of highlighted what we thought are those clues. You know, generally, it, like in this question, like a lot of questions are going to start off with demographics. In this case, we're told it's a three-year-old boy. So that automatically is helping us out, knowing that this is a pediatrics case. Oftentimes, then, they'll tell you why is the patient being brought to the hospital, seeing the, the going to the ER. 
And in this case, it's because of this rash. And they tell us a little bit um, about chronicity, okay? Um, a lot of times that's often the next thing that comes, you know, has this been going on for a few minutes? Has it been going on for a few months, okay? So as you can see there, the, the important clues that we thought were important to highlight in this vignette, um, especially those physical exam findings, and some of those lab findings, okay? And then with that question, they're asking about an association with the disease process that this patient has. So I think we've got a, a nice two-step question here. I think, one, we've got to come up with the disease process, and then two, we've got to figure out an association with that process. So I think we've got a nice two-step question here. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at those answer choices. So. Um, actually, first, let's take a look at this rash. You can get a nice close-up um, of these palpable purpura um, on the lower extremities. Might also be a little bit on the arms there, as you can see. Okay. And if you can just imagine if you were to touch that, how you could feel it and how it could maybe be almost filled with blood, in essence. Okay. So purpura, and it's definitely palpable. So. Let's take a look at the answer choices. And when we recommend, uh, when we work with students, we actually recommend that students, when they go through their answer choices, that they actually start at the bottom and that they work their way up to the top. Um, and the reason we do this is because a lot of times we'll see students who, you know, they'll start at the top, they'll see something they like, and then they'll select it without having gone through all the answer choices. And thus, sometimes they'll get that question wrong. So we recommend doing it this way to prevent yourself from making that mistake and to prevent yourself from biasing yourself. So let's go ahead and let's do that now. E, intussusception. D, impaired glucose tolerance. C, high antistreptolysin O titer. B, hemoptysis. And A, hearing loss. So we're going to go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer here, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Parra. So we're going to kick it off. We've got a uh, what seems to be a two-step question, and uh, again, got a lot of uh, uh, of information to uh, to parse. Uh, hopefully, you got a good look at that image, and uh, really, really homed in on some of the, uh, the, 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 the exam findings. What do you think is associated with this patient's disease process? Looks like a little over half of you have uh, cast your vote here. So let's see, we've got a little, uh, give you another few seconds before we close the poll. As a reminder, we do have a raffle at the end of each question lab. You do need to be here uh, in order to win. Somebody is going to uh, get the new RX360 Plus Step 2 bundle in tonight's giveaway. Okay, looks like uh, oh, almost 70% of you have voted. So I'm gonna close the poll and uh, let's share these results. So it looks like this is a pretty much a, of a two-horse race, according to uh, you guys tonight, uh, with high anti-streptolysin O titer uh, in the lead with intussusception uh, second, with about a third of you voting for that one. Okay, great. Well, let's... Um, Let's hide these results and see what the answer is. And the answer is E, intussusception. So it uh, looks like uh, about a third of you got this one right. Uh, everyone else, let's stay tuned and uh, figure out what, uh, uh, why, uh, why you got this one incorrect. Pars. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Definitely a tough question. So. Let's take a look at this clinical question, this nice pediatrics case. So, you know, we're told that he had a cold two weeks ago, and now he's got this purplish, violaceous rash on his thighs and his buttocks, right? His lower extremities and his buttocks. He's got abdominal pain, 
He's got aches and pains in his legs, so some arthralgias maybe. We also are told about blood in the urine and protein in the urine, so maybe some kidney damage. So this is a common tetrad of HSP or henoch schonlein purpura. Okay, it is a small vessel vasculitis, an IgA type vasculitis, where you get palpable purpura. So whenever you see palpable purpura, you want to think about vasculitis. Okay, that means the blood vessels are damaged, and that's why blood is pooling out into the skin. That's why you can feel it because it's damaged. Okay. So when you see palpable purpura, you definitely want to think about vasculitis, okay? In all of those findings, the joint pain, the abdominal pain, can be seen in henoch schonlein purpura, okay? Now, HSP has a lot of complications, okay, especially in the GI tract, but most classically, especially in kids, is intussusception, okay? If we take a look at the next slide, and we've kind of pulled up some screenshots from the first aid for step 2 CK book. And this is talking, um, this is the high yield, uh, the, the chapter on pediatrics. You can see there that intussusception is a condition where part of the bowel kind of telescopes into another segment. Okay. And some of the risk factors for that, as you can see there, one of them is henoch schonlein purpura or IgA vasculitis. Okay. So in this case, this would be a complication that we could expect, or that, sorry, that we would want to be on the lookout for in a patient with HSP. So if we go back to our question, hopefully you can see now why, one, that was the diagnosis they were getting at, and two, why that's an association, okay? And these are often how step two questions are going to be. They're going to ask you about disease association, complications we need to be on the lookout for. Now, in impaired glucose tolerance, that would be more so if we were dealing with a diabetic patient. A high antistreptolysin O titer, that would be more, more so if this was post infectious glomerulonephritis. And I could maybe see how, you know, maybe you were thinking that with the blood in the urine and maybe the little protein, but that doesn't necessarily explain the rash and some of the other signs and symptoms as well. Hemoptysis, um, that would be a thought if. You know, you had a different type of vasculitis, like uh, granulomatosis with polyangitis, um, uh, which is more of a medium vessel or anca vasculitis. Um, and hearing loss, that could be seen if, you know, this patient had Alport syndrome, um, which is a little bit different than what's going on here. So the best answer here is answer choice E. Excellent. Thank you, Para. So uh, as Para said, palpable prefera. Think about vasculitis. There's your uh, one of your takeaways for this evening session. Think about that alliteration. Um, very good. Well, um, that's a good start. Uh, if, uh, if you didn't get that one right, that's okay. The key thing is that you're learning uh, and that you get that question right on exam day. So uh, let's go to question number two. And again, we're going to start by reading the lead in. Which of the following is the best next step in management for this patient? So this is a best next step in management question. So uh, think about the, the, the type of uh, data that you're going to be looking for as we read the vignette. Here we go. A 20-year-old woman arrives for her first prenatal visit and reports painless vaginal bleeding for the past week and has passed some blood clots. The patient estimates that she is about 8 to 10 weeks pregnant but does not have ultrasound confirmation. There is no associated fever, cough, difficulty breathing, bleeding from other sites, or history of trauma. She reports taking prenatal vitamins as directed and denies a history of smoking, alcohol, or illicit drug use. Her temperature is 37.7. Heart rate is 99. Respiratory rate is 17. Blood pressure is 130 over 82. Oxygen saturation is 98% on room air. On examination, her uterus measures larger than expected based on her dates. The cervix is closed and a small number of blood clots are present in the vaginal vault. Ultrasound findings are shown in the image. 
no fetal heart tones are noted. So again, which of the following is the best next step in management for this patient? Think about how many steps uh, you would need to, uh, to, uh, to take in order to reach the answer as we work and pass it over to Paris. Paris? Thank you, Jeff. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this question now. So a little bit of an older patient, a 20-year-old woman. So um, as you can see here, that's relevant because this is kind of more of an OBGYN step two question, okay? So you definitely want to take note of anything that can be related to what's going on, especially pregnancy, okay? So this patient estimates her pregnancy, um, but you know doesn't have ultrasound con confirmation. Why is she coming in? Well, she was having painless vaginal bleeding. Okay, so painless versus painful. You also want to know the time frame which they're having bleeding. All important things there, right? Um, they then tell us some important examination findings. I won't go too much into that because um, that might get to the diagnosis, but you can see there you want to make note of all those things. The size of the uterus, is the cervix open or closed? Um, is there anything passing through the cervix, anything in the vaginal vault? Um, what do you see on ultrasound? How's the, the fetus doing? All of those things are kind of telling us there. So in those couple sentences, we're being told a lot of information. and We need to use that to kind of rack our brain for that differential diagnosis. Okay? You can see there, though, this question takes it a step further. They're asking about the best next step in management. So one, not only do we need to know what's going on in terms of diagnosis, but two, we need to know about management. Okay, so management of this diagnosis. Okay, and on top of that, you can see there that it's asking about the best next step as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at the answer choices here. And actually, I think we'll have a little bit of a blow up of that ultrasound finding, so you can get a nice, good look at that ultrasound finding, which looks more clear than a real ultrasound finding if you've ever used an ultrasound machine, but we'll go ahead and then take a look at those answer choices in a second. And what we see here are five answer choices, and once again, uh, we'll go ahead and start at the bottom and work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, suction curatage. D, methotrexate. C, measurement of beta HCG. B, hysterectomy and A, CT chest. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select the answer you think is the best answer here, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Okay, thank you, Paris. So again, uh, you know, these the, a lot of these step two questions, you've got uh, a lot of data, <laughs> a lot of information about the patient, about their history, about, uh, exam findings plus in this case uh you know you, you're getting to see the ultrasound um so you kind of have to you know, this is really one of the reasons why you have to be very uh you know methodical in answering these questions because uh you know you, you've really only got about you know 90 seconds right in order to you know uh, crack this code and uh, come up with the right answer so uh let's go ahead just make sure that you are registering your vote now and looking at the uh, at the poll here almost uh, two-thirds of you have voted and uh, again we've got a looks like another uh, two horse race for this one so I'll give you just a few more seconds and then we will share the results okay three two one okay we're going to close this poll and let's share these results um and again looks like um uh, almost half of you went with measurement of beta hcg uh while uh almost uh 40 of you with went with uh, suction curatage so uh with that i'm going to hide the results and show the answer and the answer is C, measurement of beta HCG. Excellent. Well done, everybody. Almost uh, half of you got that one right. Uh, for those of you who didn't, uh, don't worry. Pars is going to be here to uh, break it down for you. Pars? 
Thank you, Jeff. Yes, great job here. So let's talk about this one. So this is painless vaginal bleeding in a young 20-year-old woman. And she says she's eight to 10 weeks pregnant, but she does not have ultrasound confirmation. Okay, so there's a little subtle clue there as well. We're then told that the uterus is larger than expected based on her dates. Okay, there's no fetal heart tones. Okay, so this is pointing towards a hydatiform mole or a molar pregnancy. It is the most common type of gestational trophoblastic disease. So once again, a hydatiform mole or molar pregnancy, and it's the most common type of gestational trophoblastic disease, okay? And what you, what you want to do is you want to check an HCG level first. You want to confirm that diagnosis because it'll help guide management. Because in molar pregnancies, HCG levels, as you guys know, are usually very, very high, oftentimes greater than 100,000, okay? So let's take a look at the next slide. And this is, again, pulling some snapshots from our first aid for step 2CK book. And you can see here that within gestational trophoblastic disease, uh, uh, molar pregnancies fall under that category, okay? And you can see there on that ultrasound on the right, what looks like a cystic, uh, a cystic mass with almost a grape-like appearance, okay? If we go to the next slide, a little bit more about it, what you see there is that these patients often present with first trimester uterine bleeding, okay, less than 24 weeks, and their uterine size is greater than date. So that's a very important clue, okay? A risk factor, like in this patient, is a young patient, okay? And what you would expect to see on diagnosis, you would expect to see uh, no fetal heartbeat, like in our patient, a pelvic ultrasound showing those findings like we talked about, and on top of that, labs show a very high beta HCG, okay? Now, one of the treatments for this is you can do a suction curatage, okay? You can also use methotrexate or chemotherapy if there's a malignant uh, portion of it as well, okay? So let's go back to our question, because I know those were a couple answer choices. So let's talk about why this was the best answer here, okay? Now, in gestational trophoblastic disease, you need, and, and actually any, any situation like this, you need to serially monitor and serially check their beta HCG. You need to make sure that after diagnosing this, so one, it'll help you diagnose the condition of, of a molar pregnancy, but two, decreasing levels will indicate that the, that the molar pregnancy is resolving. However, if it does not resolve, or if it, if it even increases, then it could be telling you about cancer, like choriocarcinoma, okay? So you need to check the beta HCG, and that's where in that lead-in, it's very important. They're asking about the best next step in management. They're not asking about the most ultimate way to remove this pregnancy. They're not asking about the best therapeutic option. They're asking about what's the next thing that you want to do if you were seeing this patient in your clinic. And the first thing you would do is you would check an HCG. Now, eventually, you may do a suction curatage. Eventually, this patient might get methotrexate, but that's not the next step. And step 2CK loves to ask these kinds of questions. So it's important to know those options, but you need to know what would you do first and what would you do second or third, okay? So when we're talking about um, what you would do next. We talked about how suction curatage could be a way to evacuate the uterus, but again, you would still need to check HCG first to diagnose it. Uh, methotrexate would be an option if this were to become a malignant tumor, okay, um, but we haven't diagnosed that yet. A hysterectomy would be um, something that would be uh, a last line option, okay, and so a few steps down the road. And a CT chest would be, you know, if you were worried about metastases, because we know sometimes that these do like to go to the lung. But again, that wouldn't be the first thing that we order. Okay, so keep that in mind, um, exactly what they're asking you in that lead. So great job with this question. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and that is uh, uh, great advice, uh, Paris, on uh, how you need to be thinking about these types of questions and 
the fact that you're going to be seeing a lot of these questions on uh, the step two exam. So being able to uh, have a logical process and, and not get ahead of yourself <laughs> when thinking about uh, the, the, the way in which you would uh, treat a patient and manage a patient like this. Um, well, we are at the halfway mark here and um, uh, just want to, uh, uh, again, you know, let everyone know here about uh, our one-on-one -on -one tutoring service called Rx Coach. Uh, and this is uh, provided to you, uh, built by the team that uh, built USMLE RX and uh, First Aid for the USMLE Step 1 and First Aid for the USMLE Step 2. Um, you know, what we do is, um, you know, we, we really work to uh, make sure that we understand where you're at uh, and, uh, and, and who you are. We, we, you know, we start with a 160 question assessment. So, uh, and we do this uh, both for uh, students that are getting ready for step one or for those that are getting ready for step two. Uh, and that allows us to get a, a, you know, a good sense of, you know, where you're at, where your gaps are, um, you know, where your strengths are, right? Uh, which is just about as important, right? You, you don't have all the time in the world. Uh, so, you know, if you really understand where your strengths are, you know where you don't necessarily need to spend as much time. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that goes into your personalized study plan. Uh, and, you know, and again, you're working uh, with one uh, of our RX certified tutors there. You know, it's not, not like a group session. It's not like a, uh, you know, a class. You know, you're, you're getting, uh, a, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh uh, advisement from, uh, uh, you know, the med students who've been through this, uh, and, and, and we make sure that they are, uh, highly trained and, and ready to work with you. Um, now on top of this, you do get access to our RX 360 program, as well as RX bricks, uh, students that are, uh, uh prepping for step two, they, um, obviously also get access to uh, step two QMAX. So, uh, you know, if you find yourself right now thinking, hey, it's January, I'm planning on taking, uh, you know, I've got, you know, board season coming up. I'm not exactly sure where I'm at <laughs> or I'm not, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm making the kind of progress uh, that I feel like I should be making. Go to rx-coach.com uh, and set up a free consult. Uh, uh, with our consults, we, 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 you know, uh, learn a little bit about you and you learn a little bit about us, uh, and, and, you know, we can see if we could put, um, a plan together, uh, that works for you. So again, go to rx-coach.com and set up that free consult tonight. Okay. Uh, let us keep moving here and we're into the latter half of question lab, uh, and, uh, want everyone to really focus in. Let's see if we can we can crush these next two questions. Okay, so let's go to question number three. Um, okay, there is a lot here in this particular <laughs> item, so um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna take this one just a little bit differently. Uh, but what we're gonna do is uh, a, again first we're gonna read the lead in. Which of the following investigations should be done first? to screen for potential complications. Now we're going to go back up to the top and read the vignette. A 21-year-old man comes to his primary care provider due to a two-month history of fatigue, decreased appetite, and falling several times. He reports that his academic performance in college has been declining over the past year due to feeling depressed. He denies hallucinations, seizures, high fever, headache, or bloody stools. He does not use tobacco, alcohol, or illicit drugs. His temperature is 37.5, heart rate is 90 a minute, respiratory rate is 18 a minute, and blood pressure is 116 over 76. Physical exam reveals prominent varicosities on the abdominal wall. He has a distended, intense abdomen with shifting dullness and two plus ankle edema is observed. 
Now, I'm not going to read uh, out all of the uh, uh, the lab results, but I want you all to to, to take a good look at them. Uh, again, there's a lot in here. This is more uh, than you would see like on a step one question. Uh, uh, so uh, I want you to take this all in, and then I'm going to pass it over to Paris uh, to uh, go through the answer or answer choices. Paris? Thank you, Jeff. Yes, definitely a nice, bigger, heftier qu clinical question here and a lot of lab values. Okay, so we're going to make sure that you guys um, get a good look at those. Um, the first thing we're going to do, though, is we're going to show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette part of it. Okay, um, so a, a few subtle clues there, um, some kind of vague, non-specific signs and symptoms. Um, hopefully, you know, at the very end, we can kind of talk about how those fit into things. But, you know, whenever you have something abnormal, like declining academic performance, um, you know, initially that, that may not click right away necessarily what that means or how that ties into things. But we'll kind of walk you through that at the very end. But you can see some very important physical exam findings, okay, some, abdo some abdomen, um, abdominal issues. And then we've kind of highlighted what we think are some important lab values, the majority of which are abnormal, as you can see there, um, some of which were normal but just relevant. To, to, to make note of the fact that they were normal as well, okay? So you can see there are some issues with um, hemoglobin, um, some issues with uh, bilirubin, liver enzymes, uh, ceruloplasmin, um, PTINR, a lot of electrolyte derangements, okay? So a lot of those should hopefully, uh, especially the electrolytes, should hopefully be looking off because, um, you know, we, we, we often get asked about that on step one, okay? And that CBC as well. You can see a lot of ab uh, abnormalities there as well. So after getting a good look at that, they are asking about investigations that should be done first to screen for potential complications. Okay. So I think we've got a few steps here. I think one, we've got to figure out what's going on in this patient. Uh, two, what is a potential complication or complications? of this condition and three what would be the investigation to screen for that okay so i think we've got a nice three step questions here i think you could take it a step further and say well which one should be done first so maybe there's a few correct answer choices but which one do you need to do first okay, kind of like the last question that we had so we're, we'll go ahead and take a look at those answer choices once again, we'll start at the bottom and we'll work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, upper GI endoscopy. D, Schilling test. C, liver biopsy. B, ECG. And A, colonoscopy. So we'll leave this here for just a couple more seconds now that we've uh, opened up those answer choices. So you can take a look at those labs and that vignette. Uh, get one last look at it. Um, and then in a couple seconds, we'll go ahead and open up that poll. Okay, we're going to go ahead and launch the poll. Hopefully you have uh, uh, landed on the, the answer choice that makes sense to you. So we're going to go ahead and launch it. Go ahead and select what you think should be done first to screen for potential complications for this, this student. Looks like about uh, a little over a third of you have voted. Keep in mind that uh, uh, you never want to leave a question unanswered on test day. Incorrect uh, uh, answers are not, you're not penalized for those. So uh, make sure that you, uh, you answer every question that you can. And same goes for Question Lab. Don't leave any of these questions unanswered. Okay, let's see. We've got uh, almost two-thirds of you voted. Let's give you about uh, five more seconds. Okay, great. And uh, another uh, interesting set of results here. We're going to close this poll, share the results, and uh, 
almost uh, you know a, a, an interesting spread here. So about a third of you thought an upper GI endoscopy uh, uh, should be done first, but uh, uh, quite a few of you were thinking liver biopsy, ECG, and even a Schilling test. So uh, uh, with that in mind, let's uh, hide those results and reveal the answer. And the answer is... Answer choice E, upper GI endoscopy. Um, so again, nice job. Uh, those of you who got that one, uh, that, that was the leading vote getter tonight. Uh, so that's a good uh, 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 good job here by the crowd. If uh, you didn't get it right and you're thinking, gosh, I, uh, I really thought it was liver biopsy or really thought it was ECG, uh, don't worry. Hang in there. PARS is going to help clear it up for you. PARS. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, another tough question, but nice job. So let's take a look at what's going on. If you're trying to wrap your head around, you know, all these various signs and symptoms, the diagnosis that this patient had is actually suggestive of Wilson's disease, okay? So copper accumulation. This patient has cirrhosis and acute liver failure, okay? We see that by the tense abdomen, the shifting dullness, the varicosities on the abdomen, abdominal wall, the caput medusae, okay? We're also told about some neuropsychiatric issues, fatigue, declining academic performance, feeling depressed, okay? We're told about elevated liver enzymes, the bilirubin's high, the patient has a uh, um, high PT in INR indicating the liver is not making good clotting factors. We're also told that that serialoplasmin is abnormal as well. And all of these kind of point to Wilson's disease. Now this patient has cirrhosis and that's at the end of the line, whether you picked up on this being due to Wilson's disease or not, that's actually the bottom line. But this patient has uh, cirrhosis and liver failure, okay? And what can happen in, in, in these patients who have cirrhosis is as you guys know, they can develop varices, okay? They can develop um, uh, varices at, at various sites, but particularly the, the esophagus. And one third of patients who have varices will actually bleed. They will have a variceal hemorrhage. Okay, so this is a very life-threatening condition. Patients can uh, rapidly bleed into their esophagus and die from that. It's a very high mortality rate. So automatically, one of the first things you should do is check to see if this patient has esophageal varices, because that could be the first thing that kills this patient, okay? And if they don't, you might want to start them on a medication to prevent varices from forming, or if they do have varices, then you might want to start them, um, you might want to even treat it surgically or other things, okay? So that would be the first thing you'd want to do. Now, if we take a look at the next slide, we can take a look at some of those complications of cirrhosis, okay? And these are some of them. This patient already has ascites, okay? This patient has coagulopathy. But one thing that could really kill this patient that we need to check for are esophageal varices. And you can see there in the management, all of these patients have bought themselves an endoscopy, endoscopic surveillance, okay? So that's one of the complications that you want to be on the lookout for, and that's one of the first things you want to do because that's one of the things that can kill them right away. So, And the investigation would be via an upper GI endoscopy to examine that esophagus. Okay? Now, if you picked some of the other answer choices, um, a Schilling test, if we go back to the, 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 um, the question and the answer choices, we can see there a Schilling test. That would be if we're talking about a megaloblastic anemia. Okay. Uh, a liver biopsy, you know, that could be helpful in diagnosing Wilson's disease if uh, we don't know uh, if, if, if the workup is inconclusive, but um, that would not help in screening for complicate screening for complications. Um, an ECG, that would be if uh, this patient was having other neurologic signs from, an, from a different uh, underlying condition. And a colonoscopy, um, that could be maybe used to investigate for hemorrhoids, which can also be a complication of, of portal hypertension, um, but not necessarily the first thing you would do. And, and um, in this case, the one thing you'd want to check for are esophageal varices. So you can see this is kind of wrapping in one, 
um, you know, what is the imaging and diagnostic modalities, and, and two, um, what further investigations do you need to do, do you need to order if you were working in a hospital, and which one do you order first? Okay, so a great example of a step two CK question. Yeah, and a challenging one at that. So, uh, you know, good job for everybody uh, for sticking in there. And I, I think, uh, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, the, these are some of the the, the trickier questions. But uh, you know, as as long as uh, you know, you're picking up. Hey, what is you know what's wrong with this patient? What are the things that uh, that that uh, that the exams are revealing? What are the things that you're seeing in the labs? Um, yeah, it it takes. Uh, uh, it takes time and it takes practice uh, to really uh, uh, to get all of this under your belt. So good work, everybody. Let's um, let's go and look at our uh, final question of the night. Again, we're going to do a raffle here at the uh, end of tonight's session. So stick around uh, if you'd like to uh, uh, earn your chance to get a 360 Step 2 CK QMAX bundle. Okay, again, we are going to uh, start by reading the lead-in. Which of the following medications is contraindicated for analgesia in this patient? Think about what you're going to be looking for in the vignette as we look at that. A 55-year-old man comes to the emergency department with back and abdominal pain that suddenly began two hours ago. It is a sharp and constant pain that is located in the left flank and lower quadrant and radiates to the groin. His medical history includes hypertension and depression, and he was recently diagnosed with hyperparathyroidism. His medications include phenylzine and furosemide. He is a febrile with a pulse of 95, respirations of 16, and blood pressure of 135 over 90. On physical examination, he appears extremely uncomfortable and has mild left costovertebral tenderness. There is no spinal tenderness, abdominal rigidity, or rebound tenderness. Electrolytes in bun-creatinine ratio are within normal limits. Your analysis shows moderate blood but no leukocyte, esterase, or nitrites. So again, the question here, which of the following medications is contraindicated for analgesia in this patient? And as you try to crack this code, I'm gonna pass it over to Paris. Thank you, Chad. So we're gonna end with our last question. So hopefully you guys are getting a sense you know, as we as we walk through what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead-in, and then we talk about it after the fact and, and kind of tie things into the diagnosis, hopefully you guys are picking up on just how subtle some of those clinical clues can be, okay? So hopefully you guys are learning from that. And as you can see here, we've got uh, another clinical scenario with a little bit of a different presentation here, okay? So whenever they tell you about pain, you know, you want to make note of where that pain is, how are they describing the pain, where does the pain radiate to, okay? They tell us about medical history, uh, medication history, and physical exam findings here. But this question is actually asking about analgesia. It's not asking necessarily about di uh, diagnosis. It's asking about medication contraindicated for analgesia. So I think one, we've got to maybe figure out what's going on in this question. Um, and then two, uh, what would maybe preclude him from receiving certain analgesics, okay? Let's take a look at those answer choices. And once again, we're gonna start at the bottom. We're gonna work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, morphine. D, meperidine. C, ketorolac. B, butorphanol. And A, acetaminophen. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select the answer you think is the best answer here. And we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Okay, very good. Thank you, Paris. The poll is open. This is our last question of the night. So let's try to finish up strong. Um, uh, still, uh, there's uh, uh, quite a bit to, uh, to break down in this particular question. 
not uh, not quite as much as we had to, to deal with in question number three, but it's a good uh, a good pharma question here for you. So let's see, about uh, a little over a third of you have voted. So everybody, go uh, go ahead and make your selection. Interesting that we've got uh, got a good spread on this one. So uh, no uh, uh, no huge overwhelming favorite so far <laughs> within the poll. Let's uh, let's see. Okay, almost two thirds of you voted. Give you another five seconds, and then we're going to close the poll. Okay. Okay, we're going to close the poll. And here we go. So let's take a look at these results. Um, now you can see uh, uh, every answer received. Uh, uh, double digits uh, in terms of uh, votes with uh, Ketorolac, uh the leading vote getter with Meperidine uh, behind it. But uh, again, no uh, no overwhelming favorite here uh, for this one. So I think we've got uh, got some questions here. So let's uh, hide the results and go ahead and reveal the answer. And the answer to question number four is answer choice D, Meperidine. Uh, so almost a quarter of you got this one right, uh, but uh, if you didn't, don't worry. Main thing is that you get it right on, on test day, and to help you do that, I'm going to pass it over to PARS. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, definitely a tough question. So let's take a look at what's going on. Hopefully you guys picked up on that this patient was having a little bit of a kidney stone, okay? Sharp back pain in the flank radiating to the groin, okay? Got a history of hyperparathyroidism, so possibly a calcium-containing stone, okay? Now, when you have a kidney stone, you know, you want to give them IV fluids or hydration, and you want to give them analgesia because this is not comfortable at all, okay? Now, the one thing in this patient, we were told this patient is on phenylzine, okay? Phenylzine, is a MAOI inhibitor or monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So you do not want to give meparity. One, you're at an increased risk of serotonin syndrome, but two, you can also allow buildup of a toxic metabolite of meparity, which can cause seizures and death. Okay. So if we take a look at the next slide, this is actually one of our uh, in 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 first aid or uh, first step to UCK, um, in emergency medicine, um, this would be a medication that you would want to avoid in a patient taking MAOIs, okay? So let's go back to our question. The other answer choices are actually all feasible options in this patient, okay? This patient doesn't necessarily have acute kidney injury, they just have a kidney stone, okay? So the one thing we want to look out for, we want to pay attention to, that past medication or the, the medication history. Phenylzine is an MAOI, so automatically if you see an MAOI inhibitor in a question, automatically make sure you highlight it because that could be coming into play with all those various contraindications and drug reactions and drug interactions. Okay, so great job um, on today's uh, tough question lab. I will hand it back to you, Jeff. Excellent, thank you, Paris. Uh, yeah, these uh, these are challenging questions, um, and there's uh, there, there there's a lot to 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 know, and there's a lot that you need to be able to uh, you know synthesize and analyze uh, in a, in a short amount of time. So uh, if uh, you know if you're just getting ready for step two, or or maybe uh, you know some of you just wanted to to see what it was like, um, you know, hopefully you can kind of see some of the the, the differences that. Uh, uh, you know, mark these questions from uh, from step one. Uh, but regardless, great job, everybody. Uh, uh, you, you did a nice job tonight. Uh, just, uh, you know, just showing up. Uh, if uh, you've got uh, uh, step two QMAX, you can just go ahead and copy down these uh, QIDs, uh, put them into uh, uh, RxSearch, and you can uh, review them further.